Uh, we'd now like to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, Dr. Janine Austin Clayton, MD, the Associate Director for Research on Women's Health and the Director of the Office of Research on Women's Health at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Clayton is the architect of the NIH policy requiring scientists to consider sex as a biological variable across the research spectrum. This policy is part of the NIH's initiative to enhance reproducibility through rigor and transparency. As co-chair of the NIH Working Group on Women in Biomedical Careers with NIH uh, Director Dr. Francis Collins, Dr. Clayton also leads NIH's efforts to advance the careers of women in science. Prior to joining the Office of Research on Women's Health, Dr. Clayton was the Deputy Clinical Director of the National Eye Institute for seven years. As a board-certified ophthalmologist, Dr. Clayton's research interests include autoimmune ocular diseases and the role of sex and gender in health and disease. She is the author of more than 80 scientific publications, journal articles, and book chapters. Uh, her, her bio goes on and on, and you can read the rest of it in your conference guide, but please join me in welcoming Dr. Clayton. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Oh, that's great. People say good morning. I love it. I'm really excited to be here, and I want to thank the meeting organizers for asking me to come and talk about uh, sex as a biological variable and the way that I'm thinking about it today as a part of quality construction. And we know that if you build a firm foundation, you can actually go and build a skyscraper, you can build higher. But you might wonder, you heard I came from the Eye Institute, why an ophthalmologist is in this position? And I'll give you one piece of data. When I learned that two-thirds of the people in the world that are blind are women and that we could not explain that and we didn't understand the factors associated with that, I was really disturbed by it and I was also really curious about it. In fact, if you look at a variety of visual conditions, women predominate, whether it's a refractive error or age-related macular degeneration, the leading cause of blindness in the U.S., or cataract. And that was something that got me interested in understanding the differences between men and women in health and disease, something that I had not been exposed to before. You might think that this is kind of a fad or maybe something you know, fairly new, but in fact, Hippocrates in 400 BC described when he was talking about an epidemic that more men died than women and that in fact that pregnancy was a risk factor for death for women. So, perhaps the first kind of documented finding of sex differences. Before I go further, I always like to recognize those that came before, and it's really important uh, in this case especially because the Office of Research on Women's Health, or ORWH at NIH, was founded based on advocacy. Uh, advocacy from women in Congress, from the scientific community, from women in general, and our scientific mandate, uh, our statutory mandate, excuse me, is to enhance women's health research to make sure that women and underrepresented groups are included in NIH-supported clinical research and to promote women in science careers. We're coming on our 30th anniversary uh, next year. I invite you all to Bethesda for our event on October 21st, 2020. And we're thinking about what women's health research is in 2020, what it should be, and what, con what constitutes women's health. So let me talk to you a little bit about some data. I didn't put a lot of data in this talk. I'm trying to stay at a high level. But even in the back and up in the balcony, you can see the US is on the bottom there in the pink dot. Life expectancy for women and left on the left and men on the right. And you can see the, the way that I saved this slide is women, well, women and men now are literally falling off the curve. US life expectancy rates are decreasing and at a time uh, when we really don't understand why. And the interesting point here is for the U.S., for other countries that are decreasing, it's for diseases that affect people over the age of 65, chronic diseases, Alzheimer's, those type of conditions. The explanation provided in this paper was for things that happened to us before we're 65, and in particular, the opioid epidemic is purported to be playing a key role here. In fact, if you look across the country, 
and look at hospitalization rates, you can see here in the purple states, all of those purple states, women had higher rates of opioid-related inpatient hospital stays. And in fact, in this time period covered in this slide, inpatient hospital stays increased 55% in women, 55% in men, and 75% in women. That's unacceptable on both fronts, and we're trying to do something about it. What about maternal mortality rates in the US? Look at this data. I usually try to leave this slide up for a while just to, for the wow factor. Just, it's incredible that a time, at a time where maternal mortality rates are decreasing in our peer countries, the maternal mortality rate in the United States is increasing. We're factors of uh, two and five ahead uh, of countries that would be similar like the UK and Finland. Well, what about putting this into perspective? 700 women die annually related to pregnancy-related causes, and for African-American women, their rates are three to four times higher, and this is regardless of socioeconomic status or educational attainment. That's an unusual situation. Women 35 to 39, which is defined as advanced maternal age in the OBGYN field, are almost two times as likely to die of pregnancy complications. And for women 40 or older, it's even higher. But most importantly, at least half of these maternal deaths are preventable. I'm going to briefly describe some of the signature programs that ORWH has, but I'm going to focus on other issues today. We support career development for women's health researchers, men and women. We provide funding for the only center-level disease agnostic sex differences research program at NIH. We instituted a sex and gender administrative supplement program, which virtually every institute and center participates, has participated in over the last five to six years, so that those investigators who are funded by those institutes could add a component. And we instituted a program looking at understudied, underreported, and underrepresented populations of women two years ago. In February, we created, uh, with lots of help from our stakeholders, both inside NIH and beyond, a new strategic plan. And this is a trans-NIH strategic plan. It covers all of those 27 institutes and centers. And we think of it as our North Star. But importantly, we put forward a vision for women and the health of women in that plan. That vision says, imagine a world where the biomedical research enterprise has thoroughly integrated considerations of sex and gender. Imagine a world where every woman receives evidence-based disease prevention and treatment tailored to her own needs, circumstances, and goals. And imagine a world where every woman reaches her full potential in science careers. That's what we want to see. So as we go on to this next section, I was asked when I was asked to speak to, to talk about something that would get us thinking. And this conference relates to a variety of ethical considerations of research, and we heard a very eloquent uh, presentation just a few minutes ago. But I'd like to pose two questions for you for my presentation. Um, and the first one was be more personal, and the second one will be more scientific. So I don't know if any of you saw John Oliver's piece, but he recently put out a little piece on women and these issues I'm talking about. And he said, we know women were different, our mothers, our wives, our daughters, yet we conducted research without considering sex. How could we? What about us? We know that research that is high quality, rigorous research is reproducible, it's generalizable, it's relevant, it's transparent, yet we conducted research without considering sex often actually in the name of performing good science. But was it? And isn't good science a matter of ethics? So how did we get here? Let's rewind the tape. It really has been a matter of convention. In fact, I was taught in medical school too many years ago that the default human model was a 70 kilogram man. I distinctly remember studying pharmacology and trying to figure out dosages of medications based on that. 
and even in the preclinical space, animal research and preclinical research that informs our clinical picture, the preponderance use was for male animals. There are a variety of reasons for that. Protectionism, good old paternalism, and concerns that, the, that a female estrocycle cycle or a woman's menstrual cycle would make the woman or the female subject too variable to constitute good science. In fact, there was also the assumption that what was fundamental biology was only what was shared between males and females at a molecular level. So maybe we could think of that as kind of unisex research. And I don't know about you, but unisex doesn't work for everything. It might work for t-shirts and eyeglasses. I can wear somebody else's eyeglasses. Uh, it doesn't really work very well in research. In fact, you could think of it like trying to hit a bullseye with just one eye open. Actually, to have depth, depth perception, you need both eyes. The two eyes put those images that they see slightly differently together. And I would say, for research, we need to consider both males and females, men and women, to have a complete picture of the disease pathogenesis and how we should be treating that disease, if that disease affects men and women. This approach with one eye open, you might hit the target sometimes, but probably not gonna hit the bullseye. And this is about medicine. People's lives are at stake. We just can't afford a hit or miss approach. So what about inclusion? As you know, you know over time, uh, issues related to including women in clinical research and underrepresented minority groups have come forward. Policymakers, scientists, citizens, women themselves raise the questions and raise the heat on this about women being prescribed medications that were tested on men. And in fact, in the early 90s, the FDA recalled uh, many drugs, but eight of 10 that were in this particular publication I'm citing here were drugs that predominantly affected women. So there was this realization that perhaps uh, inclusion was important, as you know. Uh, NIH had a, a policy some time ago, but uh, that policy became law with the 21st, uh, with, excuse me, with the NIH Revitalization Act in 1993. And in the, with the 21st Century Cures Act, inclusion was actually extended. So women and underrepresented groups, children and individuals of all ages, including adults over 65, should be included in research unless there's a scientific or ethical reason not to include them. So today, what do you see? About half of the participants of NIH-supported clinical trials are women, and they have been for some time, so that's good news. But is it? Women are still underrepresented in certain disease categories, and I know you can't read that from the back, but the bottom line is that that paper looks at the prevalence the proportion of disease-affected individuals who are women and the proportion of women in the studies of those diseases, and they're routinely lower. In the preclinical space, we still see an over-reliance on male animals, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So, and I'll talk about the fact that maybe we should think we had not enough progress where it really counted where we need to look at that data and analyze it by sex so we can interpret the results of the studies. So what about over-reliance on male animals? In fact, this paper looked at neuroscience and a variety of other fields and found that there was a male emphasis in eight of the 10 basic biological disciplines in neuroscience, unfortunately, was one of the worst. There is some good news there is a reduction in the proportion of papers that don't report the sex of the animals or cells. That's a good thing. And that's the orange going from 2010 to 2014. But look at this information. On the number of studies that considered sex as a variable and disaggregated their results, problematic. So why might that be important? So here's just some generic data. And if you, you know, treated the red group and the blue group, control and treatment with disease, you know, treatment X, and looked at a disease impact, you might get data like this. And that data could come from data that looks like this. Very different situation in male and female animals. And when I show this, lots of people say, 
but that doesn't really happen. That's too different. That's not how it is. But that is how it is. That's real data from a preclinical stroke model. And in fact, this test uh, intervention reduced the size of the stroke in the male animals and increased damage in the female animals because this particular intervention was working on a molecular pathway that is associated with cell death, neuronal cell death in this case, in males but not females. So cell death, it's a pretty basic process, using a different pathway in males and females. So as you heard, NIH has in the past a couple of years re-emphasized rigor and reproducibility. And two of the cornerstones of science as we know it are in scientific advancement are rigor in designing and performing scientific research and the ability to reproduce that research. The application of rigor ensures robust and unbiased experimental design. It's biased if you're only glued one sex methodology, analysis, interpretation, and reporting of results. And the landmark sex as a biological variable policy set new expectations that investigators doing vertebrate animal and human studies would factor SABV into their research designs, analysis, and reporting. And I talked to the public about this a lot, and here's our plain language version of SABV policy. We expect investigators to consider when they're designing their studies, selecting their research question, how sex might need to be included. And if they don't include both sexes, explain why not. Collect data in a way that you can separate it so you don't mix things together. Characterize your findings by sex, analyze them and talk about them. And when you communicate, tell us what you found by sex. So there certainly has been some progress. And in fact, in the two years, Following uh, the SABV policy implementation, NIH received over 110,000 applications that would be in the category of being covered by this policy. Tens of thousands of researchers now know about SABV and science, and, and science, excuse me, scientific journals, editors and publishers are in some cases prospectively updating their instructions to authors and changing their policies and I refer to the Sex and Gender Equity and Research, or SAGER, guidelines as one example. Some professional societies and other groups are also changing their policies. And the 21st Century Cures Act now requires that applicable, clinical, applicable phase three clinical trials submit their analysis, for valid analysis stratified by sex, gender, and race, ethnicity um, for trials that started as of December 2017. But that's going to take some time for us to see those results. But there really hasn't been nearly enough progress for me. Sex-specific results are still not routinely reported, even for phase three cl clinical trials. Stacy Geller repeated her analysis in 2018 and found that fewer than a third of phase three clinical trials have any sex-specific results of any kind reported in their publications. In fact, it went from 31% to 27%. Studies still do not routinely consider sex-specific health and disease characteristics when they design the study. Inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, for example. Sex-specific reprodu reproductive health stages are not routinely considered. And potential differences for women from men are not something that is on everyone's mind. So why does it matter? It matters because sex as a, considering sex as a biological variable creates a more complete knowledge base. It informs and can improve the design of clinical research and human trials. It informs the development of sex and gender appropriate medical care for all of us. It can enable individualized care for women and men. We think of SABV as the first step on the road to precision medicine. You shouldn't jump over that step to get to a molecular level, and in fact, that molecular level might be interacting with sex. It helps us to foster systems-based understanding of influences of sex and gender on health and disease. It's said that every cell has a sex. Every cell in your body has a sex. It's either XX, XY, or some variant. That cellular level 
is affected at the organ level, right? And that affects the organism or person. And all of those interact with each other simultaneously. So from sex effects at the level of cells, which contribute to sex influences at the level of systems, sex, effect, sex differences at the level of the individual, it's necessary not only to understand the impact of sex at a basic science level, but to apply them as appropriate to clinical care. And from our perspective at NIH, we have a responsibility to look at this, to obtain the most rigorous, complete, unbiased, and reliable information as possible, to produce rigorous and reproducible research trusted by science and the public, to spend taxpayer dollars wisely and efficiently, maximizing return on investment, and an ethical duty to the women who participated in the clinical trials to ensure that they benefit from their participation. So we'd like to put forward that we need to move from a unisex approach to a multidimensional approach that I'm calling the blueprint for women's health. And this is something that is not about just women, it's about everyone. As women play central roles in our society as themselves, as mothers, as caregivers, as providers, as decision makers, they make 80% of health decisions, among other roles. Their health and well-being are central to the health and well-being of society. So here's the basics of doing this. First, we need to assess our gaps in knowledge in the major chronic diseases with regard to sex influences and sex differences, because we now know that sex matters. So we need to understand that for every chronic disease and every system. We need to develop research agendas that address those gaps with the right questions. If you're starting with a question that doesn't consider sex, we've lost the game from the outset. We need to execute those studies to answer the right questions through studies of both sexes, through single sex clinical studies for females and males, or female targeted animal models as appropriate. So we like to think about this as part of the multidimensional framework and the complex interaction of factors that affect the health of women. And on the bottom there, you see the biological perspective, first and foremost sex, at, which has influences at the genetic, cellular, molecular level, as I mentioned. In the middle, a life course approach is very important. And then women in context, external factors, gender, social determinants, behavior, toxic exposures, a variety of other uh, policies, et cetera. And these all intersect in the context of a life course to create this complex situation about health. And it's really important for us through this life course perspective to think about how steps on your life course are connected and to connect those dots. For example, we now know women who experience preeclampsia are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease, stroke, and, high, and heart attacks later in life. But a recent study also showed that they're, incre they're at increased risk for hypertension within three years of the pregnancy. And to do that, I'm really excited to share with you a couple of firsts. ORWH's first R01 and NIH's first R01 on sex and gender. This R01 supports disease agnostic research across scientific disciplines to understand how both sex and gender uh, factors influence health and disease. We're collaborating with 11 institutes and centers and offices to do this. And they, the applications must address goal one of the strategic plan. The first receipt date is November 25th. As I come towards the end of my comments, I'm gonna put forward a challenge to all of us. Despite sex as a biological variable, being much heralded by many, in fact, every time I talk to the media about this, people ask me, I thought you were doing this. They say, I thought this was happening. What do you mean this is a new thing? Um, Despite SABV being policy of NIH, the largest biomedical research institution in the world, 
despite consensus that good science requires consideration of sex as a biological variable, and recognition that considering SABV produces a more complete knowledge base, maximizes resources, and the potential risk for our mothers, our wives, our daughters, ourselves from not considering sex, Adoption and application and incorporation of SABV in study designs, data analysis, interpretation of findings, and reporting has been slow and uneven. So I'll leave you with these two questions. What is it going to take to get all of us to consider sex as a biological variable when we are performing health-related research and we are studying diseases that affect men and women? And if SABV is good science, isn't studying both sexes an ethical imperative? We think that studying both sexes should be a guiding principle for bi biomedicine, that it leads to better science and better health. So again, thank you for inviting me to this amazing meeting. I definitely have never been to a meeting that opened with a with a musical number like that, you guys are special, and I mean it in a very nice way. So I'm enjoying the meeting, uh, and I look forward to talking to you and having questions about this topic. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Clayton. Uh, we will be taking questions. Uh, as you look across the room, there are mics positioned uh, on each aisle in the front and the back. I, and I can't see you. I didn't bring a visor either. So I will try my best to see who's standing. OK, I think we have our first question over here. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Sean. I'm here from PATH. This is my first time attending. And I have a quick question for you about uh, women in research. I had recently read in Richard Harris's book, Rigor Mortis, about the, the sex of researchers themselves affecting the outcome of animal research. Do you have any comments on that? So actually, uh, data shows that when there are more women on a team, papers are more likely to have any sex or gender related information. So that's been documented. I, of course, I believe there should be uh, more women on virtually every team in research, and we've made some progress, but we have a long way to go. For example, women have been receiving over half of life sciences PhDs for over 20 years, but you, but you know, the proportion of NIH grant applicant PIs, excuse me, who are women is about 30 percent or lower. And you see in progression in faculty situations, we'll see women well represented at the earliest faculty stage, but in terms of associate professor, full professor, and leadership positions, we don't see women in those positions. And we now know it's not a pipeline issue because women have been in that pipeline. For some disciplines it may be, but not for life sciences. And so I, uh, a, a more diverse team, I think it's been also well documented, more diverse teams perform better. If they're on boards, those companies do better. Um, they solve problems in different ways. They come up with different solutions. And so diversity is inherent to uh, excellence. And so I'm not surprised uh, by that data or, or that finding. And it's just one other reason why we need to make sure that the biomedical research workforce is inclusive and that everyone is welcome. Thank you. So maybe we'll just go here. Is that okay? Here and here and just alternate. Okay. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for an inspiring talk. Um, Lydia Furman from Rainbow in Cleveland. So can you just share your um, un scientific and I guess lay also understanding of the difference between sex and gender? So this great question about sex and gender. And so we consider sex a biological variable determined by your chromosomal complement, so XX or XY, as I mentioned, typically matching your reproductive organs. And of course, there are, um, uh, there are cases where that is not the case. So I don't want to minimize that. But the vast majority, and so then gender 
is much more complicated, is a social construct with multiple dimensions, from gender identity, how you feel inside, who you are, as well as gender norms, our expectations, gender dynamics, how we interact with each other. Uh, there are a variety of domains of gender which make it a lot more complicated. But let me give you just a, an easy example. So ge a gendered behavior might be caregiving. And in our country, women do more of the caregiving than do men. And why that might be important is because it might have an effect on your health. And so we need to account for that when we design studies in a variety of ways. Uh, gender behavior might be also help-seeking behavior. We know in general women tend to ask for help more often, and health care um, might be one way to do that. Or a gendered behavior may be, um, a gendered expectation may be, is it okay to say you're, that you're sad or depressed? And we know that for men that may not, may not be the case, and I'm generalizing here, okay, just to make a point. That's really important because, for example, for depression, our inclusion criteria and our diagnostic criteria will say things like, you know, feeling sad for over this period of time. It doesn't say, for example, increased risk-taking behavior, which we may see in men who are depressed. So our diagnostic criteria are also biased because they're biased by a particular pattern. In this case, that's the more typically pattern that you see in women, right? So we need to understand our diseases both in terms of how sex makes them different. For example, cardiovascular disease, women might present differently um, versus gender, which also may have an effect. And then they interact with each other. So obviously it's really complicated, but unless we start peeling this back, we're never gonna get to the point where we really can individualize care for each and every person. And each and every one of us deserves that. Good morning, uh, George Kasparis. Thank you, Dr. Clayton, for a stimulating uh, start to the conference. Great presentation. I was surprised by one of your slides that showed eight out of 10 women uh, or drugs that were called by FDA involved eight out of 10 women. I may have that slide wrong. Uh, do you have data? What breakdown was women to childbearing potential versus postmenopausal? Does it matter? And the second part of the question, um, it seems like we made progress in enrolling women to childbearing potential, at least in the industry-supported trials. Uh, how do you view where we are today, and do we need more progress, or how much of a factor is women to childbearing potential and liability risk shunning uh, enrollment of women? Thanks for those questions. So the first one is I'm citing a paper where they're talking about 10 drugs that were withdrawn from the market. And eight of those 10 drugs had more, they were more relevant to women for two reasons. First of all, they were treatments for conditions that affect more women than men, like depression, or more women took those medications than men for whatever reason, like sleeping aids, right? So I was trying to highlight the differential impact there. And I don't know the breakdown in terms of childbearing age from that particular publication. Um, regarding women of childbearing age and inclusion in clinical research, both pharma and uh, NIH supported clinical research, um, it's, it's a huge issue. Um, and the issue related to pregnant women is important as well. In fact, there is a task force called PREGLAC that is uh, ongoing now that is looking at uh, including pregnant women and lactating women in clinical research. But in terms of childbearing age, that is an issue because women of childbearing age are affected by diseases that we're studying. So we need to figure out ways to do that better. I think that progress is clearly needed and um, I'm inspired by the number of people that I see in this room and that are at this meeting in terms of coming up with ways for us to learn more how to do this better, but if you're not paying attention to it from the beginning, you know, we're not, we're not doing what we can. So I'm excited that, that you asked the question and that people are thinking about this more. Okay, over here. Hi, Jennifer Armstrong, University of Colorado. First of all, thank you, former Birch Scholar, um, 2010. Um, working in pharmacovigilance and international cardiovascular trials. What insight do you have um, in using recruitment for women internationally? It's, it's really interesting. We're doing a 
okay job in the United States in these trials, but when we break it down by geographic region, we see that that really falls out. So it's a great question about recruitment of women internationally. And I think the, the first piece is uh, recruitment of women, you know, you need to have a plan for that just as you would have a plan for anything else. And it needs to be specific and customized to the particular study and the context where you're performing that study. So I talked about the two thirds of people being uh, blind are women, for example, and, and that is predominantly, even though it is in the US as well, many of the preventable cases are, are internationally. And they're about access to care in some cases in terms of expectations and then also just resources. If one person in a family is going to get cataract surgery, it's not gonna be the woman in many cases. So understanding your context is important. Uh, we updated, we're, we're actually almost, I actually double checked before I came here, we're updating our an inclusion toolkit online with, that has case studies and information about recruiting and retaining women in studies and the variety of ways to do that. And I'm sure you're very aware of the, the, the ways that are pr done primarily in the US. But I think that having individuals from the community involved in studies and planning studies from the beginning is one way to make sure that you are aware of the best strategies for recruitment in a particular context. Women also tell us that because of their responsibilities, um, if, the, if this appointment is gonna be at a certain time of the day, they can't do it. If their childcare isn't provided, they can't do it. Uh, if, if the requirements of the study are burdensome, that's not gonna happen. You know, so thinking through all of that in the context of where you are and what is um, best there with input from the community, I think would be the best strategy. Good morning, and thank you so much for your uh, presentation. It was very eye-opening. I'm Kathy Murphy from the State University of New York at New Paltz. Um, I work in behavioral health. I'm a music therapist. And so I'm wondering if as much rigor or as much looking has been done in clinical trials uh, for behavioral health interventions, like the non-pharmacological stuff, and what the ratio is of men and women in those types of studies. So while I don't have a, a ratio that I can give you for those types of clinical trials, I would say that uh, I'm not aware that the story is much different. I, um, you know, some social scientists are ahead of the game on this in terms of gender, and really are, we're trying to learn from our social science colleagues about that. And so to the extent that uh, they would be involved in, of course, behavioral studies, they may be thinking about those issues. But in terms of reporting the results, you asked about phase three clinical trials. So, you know, the, the paper that I cited included behavioral clinical trials, I'm sure. And so, I mean, with fewer than a third of them reporting results of phase three clinical trials, the trials that we use to make decisions, clinical decisions to develop clinical guidelines, it seems that it's a pervasive problem. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to work across disciplines and work with our uh, social science colleagues and our, uh, to be able to, and many of them are um, ahead of the game as well as, as I mentioned, but also methodologists who can help us better understand how to design studies that are feasible, that are doable, that are informative, um, because we know their challenges. It's not easy, we get that. Uh, but we need to develop some ad additional strategies. Adaptive designs can be employed so that we could upfront, maybe actually even decrease the number uh, of subjects required for particular studies. And this is particularly important in preclinical research where there are small ends in these groups of mice anyway <laughs> for the primary outcome measure. So uh, we, we really need to be able to attend to it. So. I hope that gives you a little bit of a piece of an answer yeah. to your question. Oh, and several things to research in my own field. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clayton. I'm Zach Hubble with Oak Ridge Associated Universities. I was also gonna ask you to comment on the difference between sex and gender, but since you've done that already, and thank you, um, I was hoping you could, I could piggyback on that by asking whether the SABV uh, is explicit about that difference uh, about the risks involved and how those risks differ and whether there is guidance for researchers who may not be well informed. 
Are you asking about risks by sex or by gender? About whether those risks are differentiated between sex and gender. Okay, thank you for that question. So the SABV policy applies to sex. However, when in the case of human studies, a lot of people have not clicked on this link within the policy that goes to a two-page document that describes the fact that human beings are characterized by both sex and gender and that gender should be considered. The policy focuses on sex, however, as a biological variable. We talk about the fact that men and women have different diseases, manifestations, different risks is probably mentioned, uh, treatment outcomes, adverse events, for example. And so we, t we have talked about the implications of an SABV policy in the context of gender. But gender is not um, explicitly covered by the SABV policy as, as sex is. And you know, we had to start somewhere. And we've made a big step forward um, in our preclinical space, the basic science space, there was not even an inclusion policy. So there was a real need to be able to connect these dots from that preclinical research that's translated to first in human where we were, had a situation where we could be first in human with really not understanding whether XX or XY has any implications for adverse effects. Um, and so that's where we started. Thank you. Hello, my name is David Asmuth from uh, UC Davis in California. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, the, uh, it's, it's very exciting to see how the NIH is really driving uh, these, uh, this needed change um, in, in funding. But um, the FDA is obviously uh, one of the gatekeepers in uh, the design of clinical trials. And in my experience has kind of uh, sidestepped uh, the issues of the ethical design of, of trials, hoisting that onto the uh, IRB uh, committees to address. Can you comment on what they are doing to kind of correct this, uh, this error and this disparity that you describe? So I really can't comment on what the FDA is doing, but what I can say is that they do have guidance related to sex and gender, actually. Um, it's a very different environment, and it's covered by regulatory uh, requirements versus you know, the NIH environments. And we do work together with the FDA and we do try to harmonize our policies and approaches to the extent possible with the context of our agencies having very different missions and covering different um, types of applications. I will give um, a shout out to the FDA for creating the FDA snapshots for all newly approved molecular entities. They are publishing their data on bisex, gender, and race ethnicity on the FDA website. So it is one step forward, but I hear you from the IRB perspective that there are many challenges for you in that space uh, related to the way that, that we do business. Uh, and again, all the more reason for convening here and, uh, and challenging us to do better. Yes, but wouldn't it be fair to say that since the FDA's mission is to, you know, provide safe and effective drugs to the population, that they would go beyond um, guidance and then require uh, teams to, to present, you know, um, endpoints that target uh, dif the different sex and gender considerations? They do require both men and women to be included in the study, but you're, what you're saying is outcome analysis by sex, and that's not required. Uh, and so I hear you because as a physician, I would want that information. We need that information. And I hear you regarding the need for that. Um, and that's why I'm calling for a different way of thinking about research. Now that we know sex matters so much, gender matters so much, life force matters so much, we really have to rethink how we're doing things. So one of those things there, I'll just take that back with me to Bethesda and uh, challenge some of my colleagues and let them know uh, that I got that question today. And so thanks, thank you for bringing it up. Hi, Courtney Jarbo from the University of Minnesota. And my question is similar to the previous comment of, you know, not everything is NIH funded. So how can we foster a similar policy of inclusion of SABV for those that are not funded. We have many trials that 
may or may not be FDA regulated, but we also as an IRB are kind of in that dilemma of evaluating an equitable selection of subjects, um, but then similarly struggle with it because we want to be inclusive, but not every study team has the resources necessary to do that well. So I understand, of course, that actually most, uh, all research is NIH funded, although quite a bit of it is. I think that meetings like this and societies and institutions and, you know, professional organizations go, can go a long way to raising awareness of these issues. So part of what I do is try to get platform sessions on many different society uh, meetings so that, that their members can be, uh, can hear about these issues. And in the IRB setting, of course, you have to think about that if the proposed plan doesn't consider how men and women might differ in their presentation or you think the inclusion or exclusion criteria are going to exclude a significant proportion of one sex or the other and it's not scientifically justified, that's something that you would comment upon, right? So, you know, at NIH, we're part of the biomedical research enterprise. We're a big part of it, but we're not all of it. And as I mentioned, this isn't going to change unless all of us change. And each and every one of us can make those changes in our spheres of influence. And so, you know, I, I've, I feel like I'm having the same conversation over and over every day since 2016 with different people, right, because people haven't heard about it. And so it's really important that you tell a friend, you tell a friend, you tell a friend, so we can finally get some snowball effect here and get the word out. And then I have 100% confidence that we can find rigorous and feasible ways to do this if we are trying to do it, if we put our minds to it, if we're purposeful and intentional. Uh, it's not easy, and I recognize that. But if we're not doing it, the research is less rigorous, it's biased up front, and to whom do the results apply? They might not even apply to men. If the, com if the findings are combined and there was a different effect, an opposite effect, how do you know when you are getting care, when you are prescribed a medication, how do you know that that medication should, has been tested in somebody like you or we have any clinical data on somebody like you so that we can say, I think this antihypertensive will work for you. If we don't have that information, we don't have a firm foundation. We don't have quality construction, and we can do better. Sorry, I know you're going to sit down. Um, last question, I hope. Um, Quincy Birdsong, Willstar Health System in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, you mentioned the complexities of, of gender. Um, so my question is, um, there's a growing notion that gender, uh, because of those complexities, is not binary. Mm -hmm. And there's even a more recent notion that um, sex is not binary either. And so the concept of both sexes is actually, there's a growing segment that thinks that that is inaccurate to say both sexes because it suggests uh, sex is binary. So my question is, what are your thoughts on that, um, on that concept, and then how does the transgender population factor into this uh, initiative? Thanks for your question. Absolutely, we're learning more and more about sex and about gender. And as we learn more, we're going to have to adjust our language and how we talk about this. Um, so, and we need to fund research that helps us to understand that so that we can be informed and it can affect how we do business. On the gender side, of, uh, there, unlike sex, at least there's some agreed upon definitions in, in science. Of course, there are individuals uh, who have a different chromosomal complement and who are non-binary, so I, I certainly accept that and we need to inc increase our attention to those issues, so NIH has actually a strategic plan and a new office that addresses those issues that we collaborate with and we co-fund research with them. And so we're, we're happy to do that and we, we want to learn more, right? In terms of transgender individuals, that research is, is done in that space, but I mentioned our understudied, underreported, and underrepresented populations of women, transgender women, were specifically included in that particular FOA, and so we're 
reaching out to our research community to say, we're willing to support this research, where, where are your ideas? There are additional challenges in measuring and assessing gender, and so that is a challenge right now. If I had to pick one for, from a research perspective, there isn't an acceptable definition. There are a variety of definitions, there are a variety of instruments out there, so it's harder to be able to do research without those kind of foundational pieces. And so those ideas are put forward in the strategic plan that the Sexual Gender Minority Research Office, SGMRO office, has put out on behalf of NIH. And so as we move forward, I hope that in a year or two I can come back and talk to you and I'll have some new information and some new language, but I, I do take that point. Um, our study both sexes line is meant to be plain language and is not meant to exclude individuals who are non-binary. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Clayton, that was great. Uh, thank you to the audience for your questions. Uh, we are now going to take a break. Uh, please join us in the exhibit hall. There's coffee and tea next door with our supporters and exhibitors. And this is supported by iMedris. And our next uh, series of panels will start at 10.15. So have a good break, thank you.